Hodges, who founded a full-time uh, practice in pediatric hypnosis and counseling in La Jolla, California, about seven years ago. It's called Center Point Medicine. Okay. Hi, this is Dan Dan. How are you? You guys know me. So <laughs> um, I'm the founder of Hattie.com and also co-founder for Nextstream Technical Institute. Um, what I'm going to do here is going just to share with you guys very quickly about the platform. A lot of you register the events here for Dr. Ann Barr. Um, two weeks ago, we had Sharon, CTO, a local CTO, um, a startup CTO. So here's our um, website. And um, anyway, what we are doing is we're trying to build a K-12 um, educational resources for all parents and students. And uh, what, what we are doing a little bit different is we not only focus on academic, we also focus on career and life skills, okay? The well-being um, of our students, of young, younger generation. And also a little bit different is we not only, we don't just collaborate with anybody, we collaborate with, with the top educators around the world. So we bring experienced teachers, certified teachers to teach group classes, and we bring top college students from Berkeley, Stanford, and other schools to tutor um, high school subjects, okay? And uh, those students have years of tutoring experience before they can tutor with us. And uh, what I'm gonna just show you very, very quickly, it's a brand new platform. I have a team of six engineers and uh, we built together. And actually initial platform was built by our interns and Ryan. Um, he's a, um, he was a high school student, now it's a UCSD computer science major. And what we actually initially is to try to help our teachers uh, who got impacted by COVID-19. And we have about 50,000 to 100,000 100, uh, teacher database, uh, uh, depending on how you count it, you count on resumes or register users. And uh, the entire platform was initially done by a team of young, uh, young students. And uh, I think some of them, Dr. Ember know about it. So anyway, um, we have, um, uh, we, uh, you know, the 13 year old at that time, uh, Emily designed the logo, everybody wrote together, Catherine, Alice wrote together PRD. And then we um, have initial platform, which is what down here, you guys can see what we have done. And I'm just going to log in here. So what we did is we put, uh, we this platform was built by our interns, uh, and um, we put all high school information here. We're going to build a really consolidated high school database for all top high schools. I mean, not top, the large high schools, and the public and the private uh, in the country and internationally. So parents and students can look up a lot of information. This is Kenny and Crest, okay. And then go back this and this is in-house engineer. We have about six of them. So you can search like we, we I just, uh, you know, took a class with, with our teacher, Mr. Brizo, and uh, we teach very advanced um, topics as well as intermediate and beginner topics. Uh, topics. So anyway, um, I'm gonna, one more minute. We have internships. This website is not optimized for internship. We're enhancing it. We're gonna publish all the internships for, high school students and for college students okay and uh, we have a partner employees they're gonna you know come and post jobs here and if dr ambar is looking for some intern with social media feel, feel free to let me know okay i know it takes a lot of work and we also work with interns to write blogs and to build their portfolios and all the blogs are seo search engine optimized and then um, so we blast out uh, almost on a daily basis. We have about almost close to 2000 Instagram uh, followers, I think 1800, something like that. Okay, so anyway, well, uh, thank you all the parents uh, for joining us on Thursday night. What I will do is I'm gonna stop share, uh, stop sharing and uh, Mr. Ambar, it's your show. So go ahead, Dr. Well, Ambar, you. sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to all of you. Um, so I went, the main focus of today's talk is about tips to deal with teenagers, but I want to give you the background of how I got involved in counseling teenagers uh, from the field of pediatric pulmonology. So this is a story of how I got involved in hypnosis and from hypnosis went to counseling and many of the lessons I've learned I'm going to share with you today. So um, the story goes back 24 years ago already when I was a practicing a lung doctor in Syracuse, New York. And I got a phone call from a pediatrician who said, I, 
I want to refer to you the most allergic uh, young man I know. He's very allergic to milk products. And twice in his life, he almost died from eating milk products. Uh, the first time happened when he was seven years old. He needed to be resuscitated. He had some brain damage afterwards. He had six months of rehabilitation. And the second time it happened at the age of 17 was a week before I met him. And this time, uh, when he had the bad allergic reaction, he needed to have a breathing tube inserted into his throat. And as a complication, his lung blew out. And when that happened, they put a tube inside of his chest to have it re-expand. And the lung then re-expanded. When they pulled the tube out, the lung collapsed again. And so they put the tube back in and sent him to me as the pulmonologist. So that was my introduction. I met the young man. Um, his name was Paul. Um, and um, I told him, we'll take the tube out. If the lung collapses again, we'll have to do surgery to fix the lung so it doesn't keep collapsing. Uh, he didn't like that too much. Uh, we took the chest tube out, the lung stayed okay, and I sent him home. So a week later, his mother calls me. She says, he has terrible pain at his chest tube site and he can't walk. And she's afraid, she said, that he developed brain damage again like he did when he was seven. And I said, is he having trouble breathing? And she said, no. I said, why are you calling me? I'm the lung doctor. She said, I didn't know who else to call. So I said, I don't know much about pain. I don't know anything about people who don't know how to walk, but I can certainly arrange for him to be admitted to the hospital, which I did. And he went on the service of the neurologists. Um, so the following day, I thought I'd come and say hello with him. I went with my nurse practitioner and I said, uh, let's go make social rounds. And by that, I meant we we'll socialized. I came into his room. He was sitting at his bedside. He was literally shaking, looking very upset. And I said, Paul, you seem very upset. What's going on? He said, I am very upset. I'm sick and tired of being sick. I want to go home. Nobody can tell me what's wrong with me. I've had a brain scan. I've had a nerve conduction study where they put electrodes in your muscles and put electricity through it. Um, I want to go home. So I sat in front of him. I took hold of his hands to study them. And I said, you'll be OK. You know, calm down. Uh, you'll be able to walk again. And I noticed as I was talking to him that he calmed down. And I said, you'll be able to walk again soon. Perhaps you'd like to walk now. And he said, yes. So I supported him. He got up and he was able to walk up and down the hall. Brought him back to his bedside, turned to my nurse practitioner, said, what just happened here? Was it faith healing? Laid on hands and he got better? She didn't know. Um, I didn't know. The neurologist who should have known didn't know. And I remember saying, if I could only figure out what happened here and could bottle it, it'd be worth something. But I didn't know what it was. And I uh, fathered away as a curiosity. He went home the next day. A year later, same young man has come back to see me in the pulmonary clinic because he has asthma. And he says to me, lately, when I've been smelling cheeseburgers, I've built a I've, never, I've been developing um, asthma attacks. That's sort of a strange symptom. So I said, you remember last year where you couldn't walk? Do you think it could be anything like that? He said, no, no, this is my asthma. I know my asthma. I said, well, do me a favor. Imagine eating a cheeseburger. So he closes his eyes and within seconds, he can't breathe. He looks like he's having an asthma attack. And, I, and I'm thinking, oh no, he's gonna have a bad allergic reaction. So I said, stop it. And he did. And I said, you're kidding me. No, no, I couldn't breathe. That was my asthma. I said, whoa, that's really strange. You thought of a cheeseburger and your asthma got triggered? So I knew very little about hypnosis, but I thought maybe some of that was going on. So I thought I'd do a test. I said, put out your hand and imagine a glass plate covering it. He did that. I said, tell me if you feel me touching you. Nope, nope, I can't feel you touching you. So I took out my pocket knife. That's the one the airlines confiscated later. And I jabbed him with the corkscrew. Nope, can't feel that. Whoa, I said, this must be hypnosis. I don't know if it's you or me, but it's worth finding out about. <clears throat> so, and immediately I'm thinking, if you can think your way into illness, can you think your way out? So I thought I'd refer him to a hypnotherapist who could teach him some hypnosis, maybe it will help him. Um, and I finally found one psychologist, there aren't many people who do hypnosis, at least on those days, even now, there are very few doctors doing it. and. Um, I said, Paul, go to the hypnotherapist, learn how to do hypnosis, and then come back and teach me. I'm interested. And in college, I went to UCSD for college. I was a double major in psychology and biology, so I always liked psychology. He said, I don't want to go see a psychologist. I'm not crazy. I want to work with you. And I said, that's very nice, Paul, but I don't know anything about this. He says, I don't care. Teenagers. So I was interested, and I went to my 
friend, the psychiatrist, and asked if I could start doing some, learn about hypnosis, start doing with Paul. And he would back me up if there was a problem. And that's how I got started. I went, started reading about hypnosis and I practiced with Paul for a good year. He was my one patient. And he was, we were very good at it as hypnosis is something that patient does, but the facilitator helps and everything worked. So I sort of got hooked. Um, that was my introduction to hypnosis. As part of that, I learned to talk with the subconscious. So there are known hypnosis techniques where you can interact with the inner self, the subconscious defined as the part of your mind that you're not one, always aware of. And I should back up a second. I'm using the word hypnosis as if everybody knows what that is. I should just clarify, it's not what you see on, in magic shows. It's not a clock in front of, a watch in front of you. It's, it's all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. It's, um, it's uh, not unusual. Everybody does hypnosis at some point. If you ever drive on a highway and go three miles and said, how did I get here? Your mind, your mind has been in a hypnotic state or if you've been to a boring lecture and you start daydreaming, that's hypnosis. And it's not mind control. Um, all hypnosis, again, is self-hypnosis. So, but you can talk to the subconscious and what was written in literature is you can ask yes or no questions by having the subconscious move a finger or shake their head or something. But I very quickly got tired of asking yes, no questions. So I asked, can I talk to the subconscious? And I learned you can have conversations with it verbally. You can have conversations and typing and you can learn an awful lot from the subconscious. And what I learned is that teenagers are very wise and smart when you talk to the subconscious, much better than when, they're, when you see them act. So part of my therapy is to teach or major part of my therapy is to teach teenagers to reach the inner self. And that's where I learned a lot of lessons I'm about to share with you. Um, because when you realize what's in the teenager, you can treat them with a lot more respect and help them find their own answers as opposed to imposing them from without. So I believe that's my introduction. I believe, no, if I can, if you can pass the screen share to me, I would like to show you uh, a little slide set. Okay, let's see if that works. I think it is. All right, and I'm gonna suggest if everybody shows, sees the pictures on the right-hand side, if you click on it and drag it to the left-hand side, it'll be great because you'll see a lot of the slides are on the right side. So drag, drag the pictures to the left side or you can minimize them, whatever works for each one of you. All right, so we're gonna talk about eight tips for parenting teenagers. Now, what I'm about to tell you that, that you can do for yourself, ideally your teen learns to do this for themselves. Um, depending on your relationship with your teen, you might be a good teacher for the teen or they might not wanna hear from you and they might have to learn these lessons from somebody else. And one of the things I've learned is I have a lot of great tips for teens, but, and I do really great with a lot of teenagers, but I can't do it with my own kids. So, because I'm the dad and you don't listen to dad, at least when you get older, at least. It, was it Mark Twain who said, between the time I was 14 and I was 21, um, when I was 14, my dad was a complete fool. By 21, he learned an awful lot. So that, that's sort of the average teenager's uh, impression of their parents, I think. Okay, so now hopefully I can make it go forward. So first tip for parent, believe in your teenager's abilities. This is key. So I know the teens have abilities because I talk to their inner selves and they know an awful lot. So as a parent, you wanna know your child knows a lot more than they may show you. And you, but you wanna know that and you wanna treat them as such. A lot of parents, they look how the teenager behaves and they correct them a lot and tell them you can do better. And the teen of course doesn't wanna hear it and it doesn't go very far. If instead you sit down with your teen and problem solve together, you can allow your teen to bring up um, the information they know. And it's always good to support the, the suggestions they have because um, they're much more apt to follow their own suggestions. Even if you don't completely agree with their suggestions, let them, let them go with it and let them learn. Sometimes the suggestion will be right. Sometimes they won't be right, but either way the teenager will feel encouraged and will learn from the experience. Parents of teens, especially if this is your first teen, um, have a hard time sometimes separate, switching from the enforcer role to the supporter role. So when your child is young, you tell your child, do this, do that. And they spent, I, I, I've worked with uh, quite a few uh, 
kids from the Chinese culture. And a lot of Chinese parents want to manage their kids. I, I don't know if that's a cultural thing, but they want it, you know, they know better than their parents and they do know better. But in America, these kids don't want to hear it because, because the culture is, you know, kids know better than the parents sometimes. Um, and so it, it works better when you are supporting your team and say, hey, let me help you out as opposed to you must do what I say. Because when you say you must do what I say, you often get in this America, you get it. No, I'm going to do the opposite just to prove I'm independent of you. So the other thing that parents sometimes do is they want to be really helpful to their teens. So they will problem solve for the teen. Uh, the, the young person doesn't do their homework, so the parent sits down and does the homework with them. Uh, the young person uh, has trouble making friends, so the parent goes out and helps them join groups. The problem with that, or, or if they come to see me, the parent wants to tell the teen story. The problem with that is that it implies the teenager cannot do it for themselves. So the one way to believe in your teenager's abilities is not just to say I believe, but to show that you believe by letting them take charge. So believe in your children, in your children and they will believe in themselves. Very, very true. So if you don't believe in them, they are not gonna trust themselves. If you don't trust them to make their own mistakes and learn from them, they're not gonna trust themselves either. So this is an essential part of raising a, a child who will do well. Next step, be positive. Uh, that's the first lesson that children come to see me. I talk about the importance of positive self-talk. What you say is what happens. Um, there's a nice physical demonstration of that with involving arm strength, which I can't show in this presentation, but if a teenager holds up their arm and resists somebody pressing it down, if the teenager says, I am weak, I'm weak, I'm weak, they can't resist. And if they say I'm strong, they do resist. And that's because what they say is what happens. So that's an important lesson. And what parents say to the teens also happens. So if you say, stop yelling, the teenager hears yell and he yells some more because that's being negative. You know, stop being anxious. The, type, the child becomes more anxious. So it's better to say, keep quiet or um, get become calm or how might you become calmer? So this is a way you as a parent can help your teen, but you also wanna be positive with yourself. So don't tell yourself things like, I'm a bad parent or, you know, my child is doing poorly and it's my fault type of thing. That's, that's destructive to you. You can say, I would like to become a better parent or, you know, my child's uh, struggles are struggles that he or she needs to go through to grow. It doesn't reflect poorly on me. So you wanna be positive with yourself. I often give this example um, about parking, which is good. I know many of you are in San Diego. I don't know if, if you've been to La Jolla, you know, parking is at a premium here. And so this is a story I tell. Um, I have a friend named uh, Lois. She uh, lives in Boston and she came to visit me. And I told her, Lois, we're gonna go uh, to a restaurant in La Jolla, but be forewarned, it's gonna be hard to find parking in La Jolla. She said, no, I won't. Wherever I go, there's always parking. Uh, I said, okay. Uh, we went to La Jolla and sure enough, there was parking everywhere in front of the restaurant and everything. Lois went back to Boston. I was in La Jolla looking for parking. And my kid said, um, if only Aunt Lois were here, you'd find parking. So I said, Aunt Lois, help us find parking. And suddenly it was parking everywhere. I said, what's going on here? Is this like parking karma? This must be an example of positive talk. So I went down to La Jolla and I say, I say I'm going to find parking. And now I find parking always. If you've been to La Jolla Shores, that's a big beach here in La Jolla. There's a very small parking lot. Um, summertime, parking lot's full, beach is full. I come in, I'm with my kids, I say, watch this. I drive to the front of the parking lot. I said, I'm gonna find parking. And a car pulls up, I park. How does magic work? There's a scientific explanation and a non-scientific explanation. And so I will ask the kids, what do you think? And mo most kids will say, well, it's either luck. And I say, no, it's not luck because it happens every time. And you all can try this on your own. You can see this works. Um, and then some people will say, well, you must be paying closer, atten closer attention because you're positive to find parking. And I say, no, usually when I look for parking, I am paying quite a bit of attention. So 
occasionally they figure it out and they say, they realize that when you're positive, you are more patient. So since I know I'm gonna find parking, if the parking lot is full, I'm gonna go around a second time. Or if the parking lot looks, looks full before I even go in, because I'm positive, I'm gonna drive in. If I'm negative, I'm gonna drive and park far away. So your attitude, being positive, creates your reality. That's a, sci that's a scientific explanation. There's also a non-scientific explanation, which I think many in this audience will endorse, which is if you throw out positivity into the universe, you get positivity back. If you throw out negativity, you'll get negativity back. The reason that's non-scientific is it can't be studied. To study it, you'd have to be able to observe and measure my thoughts. And you can't do that, that will never be done. And that's why it's not scientific, but it doesn't mean it's not true. So be positive. Henry Ford, the manufacturer of Ford cars knew this 200, 100 years ago. He said, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. Whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. So I teach that to the teenagers and I'm gonna tell this to the parents as well. If you say, oh, my child is impossible, I can't do anything with them, you're right. Oh, I want to learn how to deal better with my child or there must be a good way of dealing with my child or, or the child's school, whatever, you're right. And the reason you're right, the reason it works is when you, when you say you can't do it, you give up. When you say you can do it, you start thinking, how am I gonna get it done? And then you're much more apt to find a solution. So corollary to being positive is using positive intention. Intention is key. If you don't intend to do something, it doesn't happen. Um, when I first started doing hypnosis, um, I thought there was magic in the words. Uh, do what I say, and then you'll get better. And after doing hypnosis for a couple of years, and, and we talked a little bit early before this talk started that um, the mind is in charge of a lot of things. It turns out, I believe, that most people with chronic illness, most people with chronic illness could benefit from hypnosis because psychology affects our symptoms. Psychology either causes our symptoms or is a result of our symptoms. And in all cases, the mind can make symptoms better. Okay. So, but if you're going to use hypnosis to help yourself, you have to intend to help yourself. So after doing hypnosis for two or three years, I looked back on my success rate and 85% of the kids did better, which is really good. But the 15% of the kids who did not improve, what I noticed was they weren't, they were, well, they were ambivalent about doing hypnosis. They weren't so sure if they wanted to do it. And I had said early on, just do it anyway. And those are kids who did not improve. And that's when I learned intention is key. And today, if a child is ambivalent, I don't even start doing hypnosis. I say, Go home, think about it. If you want me to teach you, I'll teach you. I remember this one girl that came to see me and she had fainting episodes in school. Every couple of days she would faint. And she had had a medical workup, nothing worked. And she was sent to me and I told her I could teach you hypnosis and I teach you how to calm yourself that should help your fainting. She said, no, don't wanna do it. I said, all right, that's fine. If you, when you change your mind, I said, when you change your mind, not if, that's a little suggestion. When you change your mind, you can come back. She came back three days later. Why did you come back? Well, I fainted again. I thought about what you said. So I taught her hypnosis and the fainting stopped after one session. Some, some, sometimes it's really kind of magical how quickly kids improve. Um, I'm convinced that if I had told her to do what I said on the first day when she wasn't sure she wanted to do it, it wouldn't have worked. And then she would have, because remember hypnosis is in her hands. All hypnosis is self-hypnosis. So then she would have said, oh, hypnosis doesn't work and then it, she would not have been able to get better with this technique. So this is why intention is key. I'll tell you another intention story. About uh, 12 years ago, I was significantly overweight and I knew I was overweight and I knew I shouldn't be overweight, not a good thing, but I didn't do much about it. Until the day came when I went to my doctor and he said, you've developed diabetes. And then he said, and so we're gonna put you on insulin, we're gonna, check your eyes, you're going to go to the kidney doctor, you have to see a nutritionist, you're not going to let you get a heart attack from your diabetes. And then he said, if you were more obese, uh, we would do a gastric band surgery so you'd lose weight, and that would cure your diabetes. I said, wait, wait, wait a minute, losing weight will cure your diabetes? Yeah, well, I said, then I'll take care of it. 
And I left the appointment and I sat with my wife and I said, this is my lucky day. This is by the way, pause of talk, so key. This is my lucky day. Why is it my lucky day? Because today I'm gonna to start taking better care of my health. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get overcome the diabetes. I'm gonna uh, correct my weight. I'll be healthy in the long run. It's a really good day. And that's how I approached it. And I used them, and my intention then was to correct my weight, which I did. I lost 20 pounds in three months. I know, excuse me, in three weeks, the doctor thought I had cancer or something. He couldn't believe he could do it. And then I lost a total of 70 pounds in, in half a year. Too fast, actually, but it worked. It was with intention. I used some hypnosis techniques. If you want to know about weight loss, another talk. Um, but my diabetes went away after five pounds. And I um, had had high cholesterol and my liver was working overtime. That off corrected as well. My doctor had told me my high cholesterol and my liver problems were familial. And so I thought, oh, I can't do anything about it. But that was wrong as well. I could do something about it. I just had to correct my weight. And you know, in America today, 70% of Americans are obese. And you may have heard that um, the people who are dying from COVID are generally overweight. So obesity is a real problem. And yet we can fix it. And we can fix it with intention. And yes, it's not always easy, but it's doable. And I teach that to teens. I'm telling you this, and it starts with intention. Be mindful of intention. Intention is the seed that creates our future. Very, very true. Next tip, be consistent. So consistency is key in parenting period, parenting teenagers as well. And they have to be consistent. Ideally, both parents should be consistent. So too often I see kids who are so confused because there are different rules with mom, different rules with dad, and the teen will exploit those rules and become unmanageable. If you give consistent uh, guidance, you're much more likely to get a child who's cooperative and understands the rules. A couple of examples. So I remember this uh, one 17 year old whose mother said she never takes no for an answer. I said, what do you mean? What happens when you say no? She said, she starts yelling and screaming. So what do you do? I sent her to the room, her room. Well, that's good. What happens then? She yells and screams some more. So what, what do you do? I ignore her. That's good. What happens then? She starts breaking things. I said, what happens then? She said, I give in. I don't want her to hurt herself. Aha. So you've taught the 17 year old. She just has to escalate, escalate enough. And then she gets her way. That's an example of being inconsistent. Now an example of being consistent. This is a 12 year old boy came to see me because uh, he, um, needed his mom to stay with him so he could fall asleep. And this started because when he was younger, he was scared and he wanted his mom with him and, and she didn't want him to be upset by leaving him so she was a nice mom. And I think she was anxious about leaving him upset. So she had some anxiety as well. But at 12, he wanted to get over this need for his mom because he knew he didn't want to go to college with his mom sleeping with him. So I said, well, I can teach you hypnosis. And and uh, you can use those skills to help yourself fall asleep. He said, no, I could do it on my own. I said, okay, fine. Again, I, even though I didn't think it was the best of ideas, you go along with the team. I said, fine. So your mom will tuck you in a bed and she'll go to her room. And, even, and if you call her, she's not gonna come to be with you. Even if you cry and scream, she's gonna, her job is to stay in the room. You understand? Yes. Mom, you understand? Yes. So the first night he cried and screamed, she ignored him. Second night he cried and screamed. Third night, she emailed me. She said, this is too, too hard. He's crying, crying and screaming, and, and I feel so bad for him. And I said, you need to be consistent. If you give in, it's just going to keep going. This, you know, this is in, in babies. This is also the case, but babies get over it much faster than 12-year-olds. 12-year-olds can be much more stubborn. Three weeks, he cried and screamed, and then he came to his next appointment with me. And I said, so do you want me to teach you some hypnosis? You can... He said, yes. So I taught him how to calm himself. And that was it. From then on, he was fine. No more crying and screaming. The mom had to be consistent, though. And a lot of parents don't have the, the, the wherewithal. This is what's called tough love. You need to have tough love if you want to help some of your kids. And that's the importance of consistency. Uh, this is a quote from Lao Tzu. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. It's nonetheless a journey 
of a thousand miles. So you got to get started and you do step after step after step. And then you, you'll get done. It'll, it'll happen. This is true with your teenagers. Sometimes it seems like more than a thousand miles with, with your teens, but you will get through. Soothe yourself. As a parent, you need to take care of yourself. Um, there are, you know, many, the best parents want the best for their children. They invest their whole lives in making sure their children do well, which is wonderful. But you can't be the most effective parent if you invest your whole life in your child. Why? Because you run out of emotional energy. You run out of steam. Soothing yourself, taking care of yourself, helps you unwind, helps refresh you, makes you a better parent. This, of course, is also true of teens who are going all out. They need to learn to let them calm themselves, be it taking a bubble bath, taking a walk, listen to music, do something every day to calm yourself. You'll be a better parent. With teens, I, I see this with, with kids who are perfectionistic, this kind of uh, tendency. They want everything to be perfect. I'm sure some of your kids deal with that because they want to be the best. So they want to do perfectly. The problem with being trying to be perfect at everything is, first of all, it's not possible to be perfect at everything. Some of us are good enough to keep it perfect in some things. But if you're perfect in everything you do, you're limiting yourself. Why? Because you use up your emotional energy and you use up a lot of time trying to do whatever you're doing perfectly. So I talked to the kids. I talked to them about the idea that your job is to do the best you can, correct? Yes. And I'm not talking about doing things perfectly, but the best you can as an individual. So the way to do that is to do many things very well, a couple of things perfectly, but something just good enough. That way you get the most out of yourself. That's true for your teen. That's true for you as a parent. So do the best you can, but give yourself some time off. I've had teens who like feel guilty about taking five minutes or 10 minutes to play a video game. Playing a video game is fine for 10, 20, 30 minutes. It relaxes you. It gives your mind a chance to, to think differently. It's of course the teens who are hooked on video games and playing for hours, that's not good. But some teens that they so want to do well, they don't even permit themselves to unwind. Important, soothe yourself. This is a quote from Misha Collins. Be kind to yourself so you can be happy enough to be kind to the world. Tip number, uh, I think you're up to number five or six. Yeah, tip number six. Use active listening. Communication is key in dealing with teens. So many parents don't really listen or they listen and say, yes, but negating what the teen has to say. If you want a good relationship with your teen, they need to feel respected and heard. And the way you make sure that, they, that your teen is heard is you sit and give them their full, your full attention. Don't be using your phone or your computer when you're talking to your kid. Full attention. And you listen to what they say. And if you want to be very avert about it, you can tell them we're going to do active listening. So you hear what your teen has to say, and then you repeat back what you instead them to say. And many times they say, no, 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 that's not what I meant. And then you say, okay, tell me again. And only when you repeat back to them what they said, and they say, yeah, that's right, then you say what you want to say. And then if your teen is cooperative, you could ask them to repeat back what you said to make sure they heard. Because oftentimes you'll find people aren't hearing each other. And that's at the core of the problem between the parent and child. If you, when you listen to each other carefully, you'll find teens are very resourceful and have solutions to their problems. Just listen. A couple of examples. This is about a preteen. It was an eight-year-old boy who kept locking himself in the bathroom. And his parents kept yelling at him, don't lock the bathroom door, but he kept doing it. So he came to see me. I said to him, why do you lock the bathroom door? He said, I'm afraid of monsters. Oh, monsters, I get it. All right, well, here's a recipe for monster spray. You can use that once a day in the bathroom and they won't be afraid of monsters. No more locking the door. Nobody asked the child why he was engaged in that behavior. Ask the child. Most kids, like teenagers, when you ask them why did you do something bad, they might tell you honestly, I wasn't thinking. And that's not a cop out, they weren't thinking. 
their brains are not fully developed. Your brain is fully developed when you're 25 years old. And the last thing that develops is the frontal lobe. And that's where we make decisions. So teens don't make decisions well, not because they're bad, but because they're not fully developed. But they do know if they take a time to think and listen, maybe access their subconscious, they know. They know much more than they realize. So that's something you teach teens. I do that as a clinician, but you can teach them as a parent. I have another story about communication. So this was with a with a 16 year old that I know well, I've, I've seen him for a number of years. And he came in one day and he says, I'm really angry at my mom. Why are you angry? Well, she's lying about me. What do you mean? Well, we went on a trip to Missouri and she told my grandmother that I uh, didn't pack properly even though she told me what to pack. And she never did tell me what to pack. So she's lying. She's just, she's just uh, covering up her own mistakes. And I said, well, have you told her that you're mad at her? No, I'm not gonna tell her. And I said, and then he said, and she's lying to me, but she's lying about something else. And he told me another incident. And I said, well, that doesn't sound like your mom. Can we, is it okay for us to talk? He said, sure. So we brought the mom in and he told the story. And mom says, I did tell you how to pack. We were at dinner, your girlfriend was there and I told you both how to pack. And he says, oh yeah. And then sorry. And then everything was fine. I thought to myself, my gosh, this is a nice kid, nice mom but he was not gonna tell her why he was upset with her. And if he didn't, he started, and he, if he truly believed that she was lying about him, then he started collecting evidence that she's lying about him. And that could cause, have caused a rift. I think a lot of rifts in teenage years occur because there's little things like that that then build up. And so you can help your teen by listening carefully. And if there's some anger or something, early on talk, what's going on, you help them talk to you, but don't judge. So if they tell you did something wrong, don't start yelling at them. How can you do that? Listen, and then you might ask if they did something wrong. Well, how do you think you could have handled it differently? Or did you like how it turned out? Guide them, don't preach them. Be the supporter, not the enforcer. Ernest Hemingway said, I like to listen. I've learned a great deal from listening carefully. Most people never listen. Practice gratitude. You know, we are so lucky to live in Southern California. Most of you are here, I understand. I don't, I mean, if you've been here your whole life, you may not appreciate it. I lived in Syracuse, New York for 21 years where it snowed from November till April. Every day I'm thankful for the weather. Being grateful is, leads to happiness. I turn to my patients that I have good relationship with frequently and say, I'm so grateful to be part of your life. And I am truly grateful. I'm, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to help people. I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk to you all. Um, when you go around and are grateful for things, uh, life takes on a much nicer hue. I've done, I've sort of practiced the form of this with kids who have serious chronic medical illness, including kids under deathbed. And I asked them this question, serious chronic illness. I asked this question, if I had a magic wand and I could take away your illness, but also if I took away your illness, you would give up all that you gained as a result of your illness, be it your friends or the love your family has shown you or all that you've learned, would you make the trade? And virtually every child says, no, I wouldn't make the trade, which people find shocking, but I'm telling you, that's what the children will tell you. And in so doing, the children realize that while their illness may be very bad, there's a lot of good things that happened that they wouldn't want to give up. That's a form of gratitude and it's healing. When kids realize that they accept their illness in a different way, it's a healing way of approaching things. It's not happiness that makes us grateful, but gratefulness that makes us happy. All right, the last tip, believe in something big. That could be a belief in a God, if that's your religion, or a belief in the wisdom of nature, or a belief in how beautiful music can be. Um, go out and see an amazing mountain. When you believe in something bigger than yourself, this is a spiritual experience. 
when you believe in something bigger than yourself, you realize that your problems might be not as quite as big as you think they are. They're kind of small in comparison to something big. So it helps you put things into perspective, helps you cope better as a parent, as a child, as a human being. Um, I believe that teaching kids, and now this audience about the existence of the subconscious, that that's big because the subconscious, as I mentioned, knows a lot, can be very wise, um, can have give access to spiritual matters. So as soon as you realize that's within you, you were leaving something big and it's that's a healing thing. I give this quote to a lot of the kids I work with. Believe in yourself and all that you are. Know that there is something inside you that is greater than any obstacle. So I'm gonna take questions now. I, I wanna tell you, I am proud that I, to have written a book called Changing Children's Lives with Hypnosis. A Journey to the Center. The book is going to be published December 8th, but you can order it now, pre-order. In fact, I would love for you to do it because if we have enough pre-sales, it'll make a bestseller list when it gets published. It's available on Amazon. I have another slide that can show you the book a little later. But thank you so much for your attention. I'd love to answer your questions. Yes, so I'm just taking over. Thank you, Dr. Amba. The book is here, and uh, we listed both uh, Dr. Amba's um, um, clinic, Center Point Medicine, that's in La Jolla. Okay, you guys click it, it's easy, one click away, and where most of you registered, and then we're going to go to Dr. Ambar's book. I changed it to Amazon this time, okay? Thank you. Okay, so you can order here. I'm going to order one myself as well, uh, even though my kids are all in college now, so. <laughs> well, I think everybody can learn, because the tips we talked about are all in the book, so everybody can learn. And yeah. by the way, I, this self-promotion is kind of strange for me because I'm I'm actually pretty humble, but I'm told if you're if you're a doctor, you can be humble, but if you're an author, you got to self-promote. So so I <laughs> I, I, I beg your indulgence. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. So anyway, so thank you, Ivy, for translating simultaneous translation. Um, do you have any questions? You can type it and you can just uh, just to say it here. Yeah. We have about 15 minutes, save for you guys. Wow, so quite. Okay, I have a question, Dr. Ambar. I will start it. So in hypnosis, I think the direct translation is put yourself to sleep, okay? But it's really not. So when people see it, I actually had to put, you know, I was sharing with my friends. They don't believe it. And I put on their Facebook and they said, take it away. We don't believe in this. <laughs> okay. So what it is, because, and my husband said, you shouldn't share Dr. Anvar like hypnosis. People don't, some people just don't believe it, you know? So, so tell us um, in essence, what is really hypnosis? So hypnosis is a mindset. So when you get, get into a state of hypnosis, you sh shift your mind from here and now to another mindset that allows you to be, accept suggestions better. Uh, the name hypnosis was coined in the 19th century. And hypnosis doesn't mean a type of sleep um, because people can appear to be asleep when they're doing it. Uh, but the, the, the person who gave it the name realized quickly that it's not really hypnosis, it's not really sleep. And he wanted to rename it mono-ideaism, single idea, which is a better description because you're focused on an idea. Uh, but that name didn't stick. We're stuck with hypnosis and we're stuck with all the entertainment where I'm going to control your mind, which people don't believe that, which is true. It's that it, you can control your mind, but it's an amazingly effective tool for it. In, in therapy, when you can access somebody's inner self and they can tell their own story, that's very, very powerful. As opposed to traditional talk therapy, when you go to talk therapy, for example, you will uh, avoid talking about things that really bother you because they bother you. With hypnosis, you can cut through through that really quickly. And in, in the medical world, when people have psychological impact on their symptoms, which as I mentioned earlier, is much is, is virtually everyone. Sometimes it's minor impact, sometimes it's major impact. You can teach hypnosis in 10 minutes and sometimes see amazing changes amazing improvement in pe people's symptoms. It makes no sense that we don't teach. It. So it has a long history. It has a bad reputation. Hypnosis works, uh, not in the way it's portrayed in the 
entertainment media. And perhaps one of the other problems with hypnosis, I should say, is that anybody can call themselves a hypnotist. It's not even regulated. So there's a lot of charlatans out there, the plumbers are doing hypnosis, and, and then they don't do a good job, and that adds to the, the poor um, reputation it has. I will tell you if, you, if you think about hypnosis for yourself or your child, go to someone who can treat whatever condition you have without hypnosis. And hypnosis is another tool for that. That's great. Okay, so now questions are coming in. And um, so first is how to handle a 10 year old with some strong opinions all the time? Well, so first of all, you wanna respect their opinions. And you want to, I guess the question would be, are the irrational opinions, can you follow, or the irrational? So if, if it's like irrational anxiety opinion type of thing, uh, then um, you would want to help the child understand that those opinions are um, not helpful to them, get them into trouble. But if they're rational opinions, I just like to argue, you need, that's your child and you need to respect it. So, so uh, say today, we're going to take the next 15 minutes, we're going to talk about your opinions, and here are my opinions, and you can decide. A 10-year-old, bright 10-year-old has opinions? Okay, these are my opinions. And, and sometimes I talk to kids about how, well, if a decision needs to be made, and the parent disagrees with you, but this is a 10-year-old, uh, the parent's decision is fine. That's how society works, that your parents have to, you know, children have to listen to parents. I would not do that with a 15-year-old, though because at 15, they're pretty autonomous. So at that point, again, well, this is your opinion, okay. Um, I have a different opinion, that's my opinion. You make the choice. And you, and, and you know, like my child, my oldest son, when he was 14, 15, would not turn in his homework. And I, for a while I fought him, but he would have said, okay, it's your life, you deal with it. And he got, I mean, in fact, he told me, <laughs> I learned with him not to do hypnosis with your children because in hypnosis, this was early on, I asked his subconscious, he told me why he wasn't turning his homework. He said, I'm afraid I'm stupid. If I turn in my homework and get a bad grade, it'll prove I'm stupid. So I'd rather just get a zero. This was subconscious. Said. And I've heard that kind of explanation from other kids. That's a way of thinking. Anyway, I, I learned not to do it with my kids because in an argument I had with him a half year later, I said, you told me, I know why you don't turn in your homework. It's because you don't want people to know you're stupid. I said, I never told you that. And I said, okay. Parents should not treat his child. Anyway, I backed off. He got poor grades, uh, but he pulled through. He got into a decent college. He just got his doctorate with straight A's in, in public health. You need to respect your teen and it's their life. And sometimes sometimes it doesn't go well. Usually it goes well, but sometimes it does go well, but it's not your responsibility. By the time they're teens, it's the teen's responsibility. You can guide them, you can give them um, you can give them resources, you can offer them therapy if they want, but they have to make the decision. It's their life. 10 year old, a little bit different, um, but I would, be, but do respect and try to flesh out, try to try to extend their knowledge. So maybe they haven't thought fully, so give them some other ideas. Wow, that's hard for parents to say that a 15 year old is alive. I think some of us think 25 year old even, even not their life. I'm just kidding. Well, in some cultures, like I was talking, I think it was a Chinese gentleman who's 60 and his father is 90, tell, still telling him what to do. And that's just the way it is. I said, okay, if that works in your culture, that's fine. But I can tell you in American culture, it doesn't work with most kids. <laughs> yep. My mom tells me what to do in <laughs> the kitchen because <laughs> I don't cook. <laughs> okay, good. So um, do you have anything to share? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I have a question. <coughs> Hi, I have a question. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, um, go ahead. We are, we are in uh, um, San Jose. I, I don't know if you have a clinic in San Jose area. Or do we can we uh, do the online um, the appointment or so so thank you for the question so we don't have a clinic in San Jose yet um, so there is actually a doctor Jeffrey Lazarus who's in Palo Alto um, that's one option but yes we do do online work as well um, and I should tell you my dream is to my book you know is coming out and this is the first talk I'm giving relating to my book on my book tour. And my dream is to spread the word about hypnosis 
And one of the things I'm working on is to franchise my practice. We're actually working in Orange County now to hopefully open up a practice there. And my dream is 200 franchises around the country. We'll see how close we come to that because and so maybe someday we'll be in San Jose. But in the meantime, um, you, you can go on my website and give us a call. We'd be happy to work with your child. The, uh, and I, and I, should tell you, I should also tell you that I have now eight providers. I've been here seven, six years and we already have eight providers because nobody else is doing this, at least not the way we do it. So and if you call, um, you may be able to see me, but there's also other people who, can, who I've trained who could do the same thing. Um, so uh, I thought um, the, you, the, for the hypnosis, you need to do it physically and with your in person. So seems like we don't need a, um, like a, a in person uh, face to face uh, appointment or consultation, right? Correct. In person, I prefer it, but, but I have since moving from New York, I still have a clinic in New York and I do I work with 10 or 12 kids. Um, on video, some of them never in person, and they do really well. So yeah, I can oh. still do on video. But if you're local in San Diego, I really would like to see you in person because it, it's better. But oh. if you can't do it, we do video. Video, um, but the, the the doctor you mentioned in Palato, uh, uh, does he uh, provide the in person service? He does. Well, I'm not sure at this point with COVID what he's doing. I just know oh. he's he's there. Uh, he, uh, I don't believe he takes insurance, and I do, so that's another. Oh, you do take insurance. Oh. I took most, I don't take HMOs, but all, most PPOs we take. PPO, okay. All right. Great. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Home. Yeah, actually, yeah. Dr. Emma, I saw Christine once or twice. I, I really enjoyed it. She put me into sleep. I fell asleep. That was Christine fun. Christine is the, our nurse practitioner who works with the adults. What was actually, that? With adults, and we're and uh, we are going to be joined by a psychiatrist in a couple of months, who can who will do uh, some adult work for us as well. So we're expanding the adult services for the yeah, parents. That, months. Yeah, I just want to try out, and I really had a good time. That's and great. she had that that ball, and I was always falling asleep in her music ball. It's <laughs> lovely. Yeah. So anyway, um, ADD, ADHD. Um, how do you have anything to share about parent a kid with AD? ADHD. Um, yes. I tell my kid that he does have ADHD. Mm -hmm. So children with ADHD can do very well with hypnosis and counseling. Uh, mm -hmm. The key though is intention and motivation. So if a, if a child with ADHD is not interested in helping themselves and is not willing to put in the work, I can't help. A child who's distressed by the ADHD or wants to get off the medication and willing to put the, the work in, um, can benefit, and I've had helped a good no, number of kids come off with their medication we are not doing or avoid medications. Oh, sorry, I need to remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, okay, Dr. Embar, you can talk now. It's good. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, uh, the children, I've helped quite a few children who um, uh, wanted to control their ADHD, who've done a great job. I will also tell you, with ADHD, is oftentimes an overlay of anxiety. Uh, the anxiety can sometimes cause the ADHD, and the ADHD can sometimes cause the anxiety. And hypnosis helps anxiety very easily in a motivated child. So sometimes you find that once that they're calmer, their focusing is much better. I should also mention sleep. Many teens don't sleep very much, and sleep is insufficient sleep causes both um, anxiety and worsening attention. So that's something that we would work on with the teen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So key difference that you guys are non-chemical approach, right? Correct. You don't prescribe, Correct. you know, medicine, right? We, right. We don't prescribe medicine for it and we don't do the full evaluation. So if you need a, a school evaluation, maybe you have to go elsewhere. Okay. We just treat them. Okay. Even though most of the provider, including yourself, has the medical doctor and Correct. insurance. So that's very unique, very different from just regular talk therapy of... Yeah, okay, psychologist, great. Okay, so here's a, a parent saying that uh, the kid doesn't really want to do mass and when get, you know, mass or any other subject and get run and get frustrated, doesn't want to move forward, she, she's mad. What shall we do? How old the child? Do we know the age? 
Is it? I think it's a teenager. Because okay. the, the, the answer would be different depending yeah. on the child. So if it was a young child, um, eighth grader, work... ninth grader. My understanding, eighth grader, ninth grader, yes, eighth, seventh grader. Well, yeah. So you need to again, you need to listen to the child and ask them, you know, what's the problem? Why mm -hmm. don't you want to do math? So, for example, do they have a, a learning disorder? Do they have an auditory processing disorder? Do they have dyslexia? So mm -hmm. I would, I would, I would want to. Do they have anxiety? Mm -hmm. or, or is it or is it just they're lazy you don't want to put in effort so so you need to really listen to figure out what it is and if if they have like a, I saw a child recently who who really has trouble reading he's, he's 16 hates reading and he says he really can't focus on it and I said have you ever been worked up for ADHD and no nobody ever raised it and he's a bright child he's gotten good grades so the schools don't care but he's very frustrated so you need to listen to the child and then follow up on that. And then, um, so I would say a child who runs away from schoolwork has a reason for running away from schoolwork. And so you don't just like force them, you have to figure out what's the reason and address it. Okay, that's perfect. Okay, so there's some work parent has to do. Okay, how about a teenager not interested in anything, just they're not interested? So a child is not interested in anything. My first question is, are they depressed? Because that's one of the signs of depression. And again, you need to listen to them and why aren't they interested? I, I saw a 17 year old uh, for the last four or five months and I met him. He said, if it wasn't my parents, I would have already committed suicide because there's no point living because I'm not the best at anything. So there's no point. And he didn't, he didn't seem sad, but he came to this decision that it's not worth it. And I just sort of worked on him to say, well, you know, you're unique in your own way and you have a lot of ability. And over the few months, he really turned around. Now, none of that talk anymore. He's like looking forward to, he wants to be a psychologist of all things, uh, which is great. And always, or he's also thinking about medicine. He's very, he's very, very bright, but he sort of painted himself to a corner, uh, was not talking to his parents. And so he was in trouble. So you have to find out. So in this particular child, he was very highly intellectual. He sort of came to that conclusion you know, what's the point of living kind of thing. Other kids may have very different reasons. So you have to, again, listen to the child and then address the concern. Mm -hmm. And the, the parent may not be the one to do it because if the communication is already disrupted and you come and browbeat the kid or the kid thinks you're browbeating them. Um, so that's the kind of child you might want to take the therapy. Yeah, yeah. So for, for us, the culture, especially coming from Chinese background, uh, it's the therapy is not like the mainstream, right? So right. people get worried, oh, I'm seeing a therapist, means something wrong with us, you know? Oh, you can just be positive. You can just change your mind, right? It, it's it's hard, right? So Well, it's, it's not as easy to change your mind because if the problem is, let's say, learning disability, changing, mm -hmm. your, changing your mind is not going to improve your learning disability. Mm -hmm. So, or if you're, if you're depressed, changing your mind, it's not like turning on a light switch. So, so... I would say, I don't know, you know best how to address the Chinese culture, but but even in non-Chinese culture, people don't want to admit something is wrong, right? And I would say, you know, anybody can benefit from therapy. Anybody can benefit from better self-regulation. So I would approach it from that perspective. Mm, that's great. Okay. So uh, folks are asking by reading a book, we're going to get a copy of it. <laughs> and uh, can we learn how to do the hypnosis? So I and help our teens thinking and emotional issues. So um, I, I when I wrote the book, I specifically did not write how to do hypnosis because there are lots of books out there about how to do hypnosis with it. My book shows you how hypnosis can be used. Um, there's a lot of tips in there, including the ones I went through today about how to raise children. So lots of hypnosis related tips. Um, and I would say also as a parent, I wouldn't be doing hypnosis with my child, like I told you about some of the stuff trouble I got into, because if it's going to be meaningful, you want to let the child express themselves, and you may, you know, you may be part of the problem. In fact, in in the Chinese culture, oftentimes the the dragon parent or the tiger parent, whatever, is part of the problem, and the child's not going to tell that to you. And yet, that might and it might doesn't mean that you have to change as a parent necessarily, but the child has to work it out. So, so. Um, I would not. I would discourage you from learning hypnosis to do with your child. Uh, hypnosis, the stuff like the tips I gave you today, and there's a lot more tips in the book, can be helpful. There is a book by 
uh, Dr. Charlotte Resnick, R-E-Z-N-I-C-K, is something to the effect of uh, using your child's imagination. And she has a lot of hypnotic related tips there that might be a good resource for some of the parents. Mm -hmm. okay. R-E-Z-N-I-C-K, Charlotte is the author. Okay, okay. Sounds good. Uh, continue. Folks want to learn. They're so intrigued the word of hip, hypnotize yourself and how to do it, how to talk your, to your own subconsciousness, you know? Do you want to practice with us for a minute, Dr. Ambar? <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, um, uh, decline right now because we don't have enough time. And I think, I think well, I, I think if you want to, experience hypnosis, you can uh, pick a, a place that you would enjoy relaxing in, like a safe place, and just imagine what you can see and hear and smell and feel and taste there. Just get a full sensory experience, which makes it makes a whole brain experience. And that's a hypnotic state. So that's a simple way of getting hypnosis, just imagining a relaxing place and feel like you're there. And then you can use that state to give yourself suggestions. I want to fall asleep more easily. I want to uh, be more creative. I want to learn something. Um, and so um, you, you can even say, even pose yourself, uh, you know, I want to know how I should, uh, whether I should trust this person. You can ask this question, do the hypnosis and an answer can come to you. That's a simple way of, of doing it. Mm, that's good. Okay, so that's what I'm doing every day. I, I call it a meditation, but <laughs> there's a part of it. Okay, that's great. So I saw a question difference in meditation and hypnosis. So meditation is not goal focused. Meditation, the purpose is to uh, get into a different mindset, typically focusing on breathing or, or uh, a certain spot and doing it for 20, 30 minutes, twice a day, and just being in the moment. So the purpose of meditation is to be in the moment. Purpose of hypnosis is much more goal-oriented. Goal You're going to go to a place in your imagination and give yourself suggestions, or somebody else can give you suggestions. So that's the difference between the two. Mm, that's great. OK, so we have quite a few questions. How much time do you have for us so you have to go? I have a few more moments. So OK, a few more moments. Okay, I want to answer your questions. This is great. OK, Thank OK, you. great. So. Parents, teenager parents be friend with a teenager or not? And where to draw the line? Where's I'm my parent, where I'm friend with, with my kid? You can be a friend with your teenager once they're in their 20s. <laughs> Got it. I, I do not think you can be an effective parent and friend at the same time. I'm lucky. I can be your teenager's friend. I, 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 a lot of my patients are my friends. I love it. But I'm not their parent. And the reason is you can't do tough love as a friend. That's not a friend's role. A friend's role can't be, I can't give this to you. Friends can do anything you can, right? You can't do, when you do anything you can for your child, you're not letting them develop. You're not, you're not letting them become their own person. And that's why you can't be a friend and a parent at the same time. Got it, okay. So um, I have a kid that doesn't teen, doesn't wanna work hard, always choose to take it easy way. So to stay positive, how can we con convince him to change? Well, you need to talk with him and, and see what are his plans. You know, does he recognize that, that uh, not working hard will lead to a, a not a good place? And he may recognize it and not care. And then you can't do much. You can say, fine. It's like what I did with my child who got zeros. I just had to back off. It was really hard, but it wasn't working. I was yelling at him. I was explaining to him nothing worked. And as I said, he turned out fine. He's got his doctorate. Um, I think you say, okay, uh, it's your choice. If you need us, we'll be help. We'll, we'll be here. It's really hard, really hard to do that as a parent. But you these kids, they're their own person. And sometimes they're reacting to you because you care so much, they, they rebel by not caring. So when you don't care so much, they might find themselves easier. Yeah. It is funny. Yeah, my son told me he does exactly opposite from what I told him. <laughs> exactly. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Okay. I'm going to just pause for one second. I have a patient online. I'm just going to tell them that I'm running late. So if okay. I might. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay, so uh, about depression, if, what, what if my kid has a depression, what shall we do? Okay, so depression is one of the more difficult things to deal with. Um, again, you want, you want to seek help. And, and depression is when you're feeling sad and having issues for more than a month. So not like being sad for, for, for a few days. Um, and uh, depression requires therapy. Medication is not the first choice. A medication alone is not a great therapy for depression. So that's where you'd want to go to a counselor. Um, hypnosis plays some role in depression. Um, a depressed person often thinks in a depressing way. So by that, I mean, um, they, they catastrophize. Uh, this didn't work out to me. This means I'm a stupid person or I'll never get better. And so they have to be taught to think differently. And some of them are very resistant to that. Um, some of it, they, they fear that if they, did something different, they would, uh, it would get worse. So they just don't do anything. So um, if you have a depressed child, find a therapist is what I would, would tell you. But the child needs to be willing to go to therapy. If they're not willing, it's not going to work. And I met a, um, you know, I've met some children who come, they're very depressed and they don't want to talk to me. And I, I tell them this is what I can do. And I say, you know, when you want my help, I'll be here. But sure, that there's not much more. Because remember, the, the kids are their own agents. Um, I guess in a depressed child who doesn't want to do anything, that's when I would think about medication because maybe if they're a little bit less depressed, they'll be more ready for therapy, but therapy still needs to be part of it. Okay, I see. How about self-confidence? How we can encourage a kid to be more self-confident? Well, all the tips that we talked about will improve. If you believe in your child's abilities, when you're positive, to teach them to have a positive intention, teach them to be positive, teach them by the power of words, be an active listener, all those things improve their self-confidence. Because if you really listen to them and you incorporate what they say and you honor them by letting them do what they want to do, they become more confident. They either succeed, great. They don't succeed and learn from it, great. They're doing good. You're giving them the freedom to, to become more confident. The confidence increases with experience. I see. And, and then my kid uh, knew that something, she was doing something incorrectly, but she keeps saying other kids were doing even worse and it really doesn't help her to fix her problem. So what shall we do? So, so she, she is denying that she has to fix her problem because other kids are doing worse, if I'm understanding correctly. Yes, yeah, something like that. So, First of all, you say, I, I'm not taking care of the other kids. You, the other kids' argument you get, oh, you know, I want to use drugs. The other kids are using drugs. Or, you know, I, <laughs> I, you know I, I'm only doing weed. The other kids are doing cocaine. You should be happy with me. So you so say that I'm not talking about other kids. I, my responsibility is for you. Um, are you, well, like this 17-year-old this who, who told me he didn't want to live, he said, well, other people could do better than me, so why should I even try? And that's a sort of, so you say, you know, your responsibility is for yourself. Um, we, as your parents, are responsible to help you do better. And um, uh, you know, the hope, we hope the other kids' parents are helping them. But I mean, we can't help the other kids. We have to help you. Hmm. If if they're using it as an excuse, they may be using it as an excuse not to do anything. And then it might be because they're anxious. And then you, again, you might want to bring them to a therapist to to see if they're willing to talk to someone. I see. Another question, how do you spot depression in kids? How do you spot depression in kids? Um, well, it's not dissimilar to adults. So, but you know, lack of interest in things, uh, sleeping a lot, uh, feeling sad, um, uh, catastrophizing, uh, not, you know, losing, not having friends, uh, being isolated in the room. Those are all signs of depression. There's a questionnaire called the uh, PHQ-9. You can look it up on the web. PHQ-9 is a nine nine questions that you can score depression based on on how the, the people respond. Okay. Well, answer two more questions. One about time management. What if my kid always chatting social media? I have the same problem about time management. I, I need to be treated. <laughs> well, so you need to talk to the child and see if they're aware it's a problem. 
if they're if they're denying it's a problem, you, not much I mean, you have to show them it's a problem. And again, don't enable them. So if they're if they say it's not a problem, and you're like you know sitting on them to finish their homework, um, I would rather that they fail their homework or their test because they didn't do their work, and let let the universe teach them as opposed to you as the parent try to prevent them from failing. And parents say, oh no, but they're not going to get a good college. Well, maybe they won't, but that's where they're heading. And if and if and if you don't teach them to be responsible themselves when they get to college, they're going to fall apart. You know, I've had parents they sit on their parent child until he goes to college, and then they flops in college because he never learned to stand on his own two feet. So um, let if they need to fail, let them fail. It's not the end of the world. The end of, never the end of the world, but it'd be much worse if they've messed up in college when they're not in the home. So give them freedom. So that's what I would, I would say. I see. Last question, uh, parents would really like to know, it's the type of patients cannot have hypnosis treatment, bipolar disorder or uh, schizophrenia? Schizophrenia? Uh, yes, um, yes, schizophrenia, yeah. I, I think, uh, well, in the literature, some people say you shouldn't be doing hypnosis with those um, patients. Um, I would not do hypnosis with those patients because I'm not qualified to treat bipolar disorders or schizophrenia. I am qualified to treat, by the way, anxiety or depression. That's part of general pediatrics these days. So, but to distinguish. So, but yes, I think um, the right people, schizophrenia, hypnosis can be useful in the right hands for both schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. But again, the, the practitioner needs to know what they're doing. I see. Okay, one more. Um, how about my kids? Uh, frequent small lies. What should I do? Um, you talk to them about um, the ramifications of lies, including the boy who cried wolf story, and you know, explain to them that you can't trust them if they lie. Uh, is that what they want? Um, and um, uh, I mean, again, it depends how old the child. Uh, so you can, if a younger child, you could play a game. So if every day goes by and, and you you've told the truth, I'm going to reward you. Like, you know, little, you know, kids, preteens love rewards. I give baseball cards and seashells and candy and like, like candy. I have lots of stuff in my office for that kind of thing. And you could do that as a parent. If the child wants something big, you can give them like raffle tickets. Every time you, every day goes by, you've told the truth, you get a raffle ticket, you collect 50 raffle tickets, you'll get a, an iPhone, I don't know, something big. And, and uh, kids can be really motivated sometimes by the reward system, especially the younger kids. Sometimes that even works with, with young teens. Okay, that's great. Okay, I know you have patient waiting for you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank, Thank you so much for the opportunity. opportunity.